आई वी एम यो गाइस व्हाट्स अप वी आर बैक विद द मिलेनियल एथलीट विद तन्वी एंड श्लोक अ पॉडकास्ट ऑफ फॉर एंड बाय द मिलेनियल्स आई एम योर होस्ट श्लोक रामचंद्रन एंड दिस इज माय को-होस्ट तन्वी लाल हाय श्लोक हाउ यू डूइंग आई एम डूइंग परफेक्टली फाइन यू नो हाउ आर यू ऑल गुड in fact uh, i was just thinking about this conversation that i had with uh, an olympic tokyo 2020 olympic prospect of course now the olympics have been postponed to 21 so our conversation was about how this athlete is coping mentally and physically with the whole pandemic the postponement of the olympics which has happened for the first time in history renewed timelines renewed goals staying motivated i mean as an athlete being an athlete in this uncertain period is is certainly tough and yeah so she was at pains to to emphasize you know the magnitude of efforts that athletes coaches sporting organizations uh the government every everyone you know it's like a team effort that goes into preparing for an event like the olympics or the asian games or the commonwealth games you know the entire team has to work backwards for years five years to to even expect to peak at an event like this and um, here we are today in in an uncertain uh, period you know it's 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 kind of tough being an athlete don't you think I mean yes it is a little bit tough you know being former athletes uh, I uh, you know somehow feel uh, a bit lonely when I was actually playing uh, but you know when I've interacted with you know a lot of uh, the you know a lot of players from the other countries especially the european countries you you really feel that there is a lot of backing and you know you know that is why the term a sporting powerhouse comes you know yes. we are india is a country who encourages sport but there are countries like china us who are sporting powerhouses right So, I mean at times i do feel uh, you know i did feel a little bit lonely but yeah that's how it is right now yeah i mean when you look at some of these macro level questions you know like why do some countries win more medals than the others you know how do policy makers actually influence the success of their athletes or you know it's it's gotten me thinking on a lot of these these issues some of the sporting powerhouses uh be it australia japan um canada even 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 a small country like canada i mean when you look at the the integrated approach uh to elite sport development uh you know the, these countries seem to have something in common you know whether it's um a certain degree of coordination between the athletes the coaches their involvement in the policy making process a full time setup of management staff at the uh, the national sports associations and you know just a long term approach to sport development in general you know there's there's definitely a formula or an equation uh behind churning out these medals year after year or event after event it's it doesn't happen by chance these things take a great degree of planning and uh uh backward planning if i if i can put it that way i mean going back to french open 2018 uh you know i was uh, i was training uh, we had couple of days off and you know we went uh, to train at the national high performance center which is known as incep which uh, is the national high performance center for all olympic sports in france and uh, you know my friend you know told me a, a story about it saying that you know after uh, the 72 olympics when uh, you know france just ended up with 13 medals uh, the government uh, took this uh, you know on heart saying you know how can we you know finish with you know a, such a poor medal tally and then incep was formed in 1975 and then they and the results started to churn out then you know and uh, in 92 olympics they came up with 29 medals and uh, you know they were ranked 7th in the medal tally in the 2016 olympics with a tally of 42 medals i mean for a country like france to end up with 42 medals uh, that just shows the amount of investment they made at the national high performance center in the 70s and then they are getting the results now absolutely i mean that just uh, speaks volumes of the foresight that the country had i mean when i when i look at uh, look at india and you know we have no dearth of talent we have the volume of players we have an incredible work ethic players are willing to put in the hours but when you look at the disparity between you know the size of our population and the number of olympic medals won there is absolutely no doubt that that india is one of the worst performers there i mean being the 10th largest economy in the world and a you know we have this repository of abundant sporting talent what what are we doing why are we punching below our weight at the olympics or at any world event for that matter i mean i am out of my depth now in this conversation i think it's the right time uh, to get our guest uh, on now to un- answer those like really 
you know heavy questions uh, so guys on the other side of the break we shall introduce our very special guest um uh, he's going to share his perspective and hopefully answer all of tanvi's you know super heavy questions uh, stay tuned we will be right back you are listening to the millennial athlete with tanvi and shlok Hello, everybody. Welcome to another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Want to wish you all a happy Diwali. Hope you had a great festive season. It's been a great week in terms of the kinds of guests we've had and the kind of conversations we've had on the network this week. Do definitely check some of these things out. On this round's on me with Gauri Devidyal. She had a great conversation with Gauri Maurara, who's one of the best known chefs in the world. It was just absolutely riveting. Do check that out. On states of anarchy, Hamzini Hariran spoke about chronicling India's different wars. Again, really interesting episode. Check that out. Ashton had a very interesting episode on his show, The Habit Coach. It was called "I Don't Feel Like Doing Anything." It's about how to overcome malaise, just generally, and I thought really, really interesting stuff. Kumi Vayana was the guest on Cyrus Says on Monday's episode last week, and uh, she's an educator. And my God, it was such a fascinating conversation talking about the way education functions in India and some of the changes she'd like to see. Just really, really interesting stuff. Do give that a listen. On Uncle Please Sit, Anupam Manohar was there with Joel and Tushar talking about the Indian economy, part one of a two-part series. Second part will be out this week. You should definitely check that out. Lastly, I want to talk to you all about the Filter Coffee podcast. Karthik Nagarajan, who hosts that show, was on a little bit of a break he's back with a banger of an episode it is with Himura Maya who used to run landmark stores and they talk about the culture of bookstores and quizzing and all kinds of stuff really interesting conversation do check that out and with that let me get you back to your show hello guys welcome back you're listening to the millennial athlete with tanvi and shlok our guest is none other than christopher pedra also also fondly known as chris uh, christopher pedra is south african by origin he currently heads the sports science team at the reliance foundation uh, he's got massive experience of about 16 years in sports science has and has worked with some of the best athletes across the world and is regarded as one of the best physiotherapists in india and the world uh, thank you so much chris for coming in on the podcast it's a pleasure to have you thanks a lot shlok that's quite an introduction <laughs> uh, not, not all of it is true <laughs> You're just humble. You're just humble. That's it. <laughs> no, but definitely, I think Chris has worked. Even uh, he's been a part of the Indian sporting setup um, for the longest time. Now has worked with uh, some of the leading Indian sports persons and has a fair bit of understanding of uh, the Indian sporting setup and the shortcomings uh, of our system today. So thank you, Chris, for coming on the show. Uh, so yeah, let's let's jump into. Uh, we have. quite a lineup of questions for you so i hope you're ready hope so <laughs> okay so um i i mean throw back to uh, a couple of months back uh, when i was doing my uh, my my dissertation and uh, my in my chat with you uh, you mentioned that india is a good 15 years behind sporting nations like um australia south africa or even some of the european countries uh that take sp- elite sport very very seriously because it's um you know it, it it's a reflection of uh being a pro- progressive society and you know elite sport is regarded given given a lot of importance um at a policy level as well um you've seen the indian setup you've seen the work ethic of the players there's absolutely no dearth in terms of the number of players or the talent that's there what do you feel is the main difference um, you know as a country wh- what is the main difference what's the, the number one thing that we need to come up in uh jeez i don't know quite hard to say you know one specific thing would you know if you could fix one thing everything would be fine um <clears throat> but what i would certainly say is that while you know uh, india certainly has its shortcomings with regards to the way sport maybe run i mean it's it's definitely improving all the time and there are a lot of really you know really good people getting involved um <clears throat> i suppose uh where one of the big differences is with india and some of the other countries you mentioned um is that there's been a culture of um professionalism in sport in those countries for a very long time uh you know where i come from is by no means a, a beacon of how you should run sports. I mean South Africa's got huge issues with a lot of the things that they do in sport. Um but some of the sports that do have a lot of money in them um and and have a lot of, you know, the right people working in them are very successful. Rugby for example, South Africa just won the World Cup last year. 
um, in Japan. And, you know, for South Africa to have won its third Rugby World Cup, um, having come back into the competition after isolation, after apartheid in 1995, is pretty unbelievable, um, you know. Uh, but then again, if you compare us to, let's say, the Kiwis, I, I can't even think of their population. I think their population is like 5 million people or something crazy. And they've won more than anyone over the history of rugby. So, you know, while South Africa's doing a couple of things right, you could always look at the Kiwis and go, well, they're, you know, they're mocking us. They're, they're making us look silly the way that we do things. Um, but then, you know, getting back to the Indian context, I think, you know, it's very tricky to, to run sport. It's very tricky to, to have a successful sporting culture. Um, India has pretty much all of the building blocks, I'd say that they're probably just not in the right places uh, as yet, you know. I don't think there's anything vastly different that needs to change. A few things probably just need to be shuffled around um, mm. and, and, and then things will click. Um, Chris, you worked with uh, the queen of Indian badminton, uh, Saina Nehwal, uh, and she has credited you for her improved movements on court. Uh, she's known to be a fantastic worker and, and has got great work ethic. Uh, what specifically did you address? And, you know, how was the whole experience like, uh, you know, working with her, traveling with her? Um, yeah, really interesting for me. I've never actually worked in badminton before I came to India. So um, I, uh, when I first got here, I think the first guys I, I came across were Kashyap and Jerry. Um, they ended up coming to see me at the hospital for one or two problems. And then, you know, through through that sort of network, I ended up seeing more badminton players. And then eventually Sina gave me a call and asked me if I could, you know, come and have a look at something that she was battling with. And then we sort of clicked. And, and on my way home from the first um, session with her, she sort of texted me in the car and said, listen, would you consider, you know, working with me long term and, and, and traveling and stuff? Obviously, that wasn't my call to make. Um <clears throat> I was employed by somebody else, so we had to cover a couple of hurdles there at first. But, um, but yeah, once we got into it, it was, it was really cool to see. You know, the, the work ethic you mentioned was the first thing actually that struck me. Um, you know, uh, Sina at that stage had enormous success. Um, you know, she'd, she'd won Olympic medals. She'd won Commonwealth medals. She'd won uh, World Champs medals. She'd done everything, basically. She was the star already, you know. Um, and then, you know, for me to come in there and start giving her maybe completely different information that she'd had previously, uh, and she took to it. You know, she was like, okay, cool, well, I'm on board, let's do it. And that, that sort of mentality, that, that sort of, you know, professional attitude I found, you know, I found very cool because what, what you do find in... <clears throat> In, in professional sports, and I suppose with successful people everywhere, is they tend to not be as open to things changing, um, you know, and, and I suppose maybe if we extend that back to Indian sport, you've probably got a lot of people involved in Indian sport that have been doing it for years, and they're probably quite happy with the things, the way things are going, you know, they're, they're doing okay, they don't see it as being any drastic failure, they're, they're fine, and why do things need to change? So change is, change is generally something people who have done well tend to resist, and, and Sina, for one, wasn't, she wasn't very resistant at all, she was, she was all about change, and let's, let's try some different things, um, so a lot of the stuff we worked on was just trying to hone her training really like towards badminton, it had been quite, uh, it, hadn't very, it hadn't been very specific um, or, or, you know, potentially it had been, but at the time when I saw her and um, it wasn't very specific for whatever reason. So we just sort of brought it back into the fundamentals of what she was actually trying to do, you know, um, it, as with anything, I think if you, certainly with what I do, we want to look at where you want to be and then move back from there. Uh, that's, that's sort of the process that we follow. Um, you know, whether that works in every situation or not, I'm not sure. You know, I'm, I'm not a, an entrepreneur. I'm not a, a tech genius or anything like that. But, like, I think it makes common sense to me. You know, if you think about what is the end goal, and then you can sort of break it up into little pieces about how can we get to that end goal, um, then, you know, we, we should be okay. And that's pretty much what we did with her. We, we sort of looked at what was she battling to do, and she said, well, these are my sort of priorities. I need to be able to do X, Y, and Z. And we broke those up and then we started building her up and, and, and she did nicely. She did nicely coming back. 
I mean, uh, is Saina one of the most mentally, uh, you know, strong athletes uh, you uh, you've trained with? Um, I, look, I'd say she, she's definitely up there. Um, you know, I mean, she. Uh, hopefully, she doesn't mind me telling everyone this, but I mean, she's openly said to me before she never thought of herself as the most talented badminton player out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but she her her mindset has always been if she can work harder than everyone else then, you know, that's going to be her key to success. So, you know, you can't argue with that. Um, yeah. That's the, the proof is in the pudding, as they say, you know, that's, that's yeah. what she's done. She's worked harder and look where she's got. Yeah, I was, I was in fact listening to a podcast the other day that uh, spoke about bringing an Olympic mindset to everything you do in life. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's all about, it's all about margins at the end of the day, because, uh, everyone puts in the work, everyone, uh, you know, some are talented, some are not, but it's, it's all about that increment, that incremental work that you put in. And I think in Saina's case, it's, um, she has this burning desire to be a better version of herself every day. And that's what fuels her, that that's probably what drives her work ethic as well. She just wants to be a better version of who she was the previous day. And uh, that's probably gotten her all the success that, you know, I think that's the number one thing, in fact, that's uh, gotten her the success that she's uh, achieved. Sure. That, look, I don't think we can ignore the fact that she's obviously got ridiculous talent. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> she, she, she certainly <laughs> hasn't got there just by working hard. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, that, as you say, that, that's a perfect, you know, that's a perfect way to put it is, is that is the, that's the cream on top. You know, that's like the, the point, whatever of a percent. Now in sport it's not the eighties anymore. You know, you can't just pitch up, be good, you know, drink a couple of beers in the, in the, in, in the bar after each round and then go out and perform the next day like that. Those days are gone. Sport is professional now. You know, you need to be super talented. You need to have worked from a very young age, the right way. You need to have been coached the right way. The systems need to be in place from a young age. Like you're not going to find people just like dropping out of nowhere going, Oh my God, like where did this guy come from? That those days are done. You know, um, people are coming through systems now and, and, and maybe getting back to the Indian context, maybe that's somewhere that, that, that India can, can look to improve, you know, is get those systems in place, the official pathways for these athletes so that they're not just relying on this ridiculous gene pool because, I mean, obviously you've got you know, 1.3 billion people and you've got a crazy amount of talented humans in this country, obviously, at, at anything. You know, if you, if you searched wide enough you'd find the top percent of people I'm sure in absolutely everything um but it's finding those people and it's it's nurturing them and putting them through the right pathway and then supporting them when they're there I think that's the catch yeah I mean no there's there's no doubt that Indian badminton is um you know in a (laughs) golden era of sorts it's experiencing um, you know, an unprecedented rise in even commercially, com- the commercial success. I mean, if you look at PV Sindhu's gold medal match at the Rio Olympics, I think there were about 18 million viewers. Uh, you know, we've seen the kind of work that goes into making an Olympic athlete, uh, taking PV Sindhu as an example. We've seen her team work, you know, rally around her tirelessly day in, day out. And if that's the level, it sometimes makes you wonder, I mean, if that's the level of involvement that, that's needed on a daily basis, how can we ever expect to, to give that amount of individual input to the volume of athletes that we have? Well, it has to be institutionalized. Um, I think that's the key is that, you know, you know uh, I, I can't speak of PV Sindhu's, you know, background or, or what she, what her family, you know, could afford to do for her, couldn't afford to do for her. I don't know anything about that. But um, the, the fact is that that amount of support, yes, she's ridiculously talented, obviously. You know, she's got a perfect build. She's got speed. She's got power. She's got everything, you know, like she really does. She's, she's, she's probably close to the perfect package for badminton. Um, but without that support around her, would she have made it? You know, without without her parents being so invested in it, because that is a you know that's common knowledge. Her parents are very invested in 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 her, and and they put everything into her. And um, you know, and and obviously she's had to make a lot of big decisions as well. You know, like with regards to her career, where does she go? Who does she coach with? Who does she train with? All of these things, making those right decisions, and and that you know, the more you leave that stuff to chance. 
um, the less chance there is that it's going to be successful. So, you know, if you could institutionalize that from a young age, identify these, these talents, identify these people with the perfect attributes. Um, you know, I'm, I think we, we're leaning away from that whole sort of like gold medal project where you go and, you know, measure everyone's arms and measure everyone's chest circumference and we say, okay, well, you'd be a good rower. You'd be a good basketball player. Yeah. We, we definitely want to get away from that. That did work, incidentally. Uh, you know, that brought in a lot of gold medals for the guys who did that. But we want to get away from that. But at the same time, while you don't want it to be like a factory process, you do want to identify the best talent at a young age so that you can get them in the system, you can nurture them properly, um, you can educate them, you can, again, as you said, you know, you, there's a dearth of athletes out there, but are there really, if you look at women's badminton in India, okay, speaking to you specifically, Tanvi. Yeah. Okay. How many female badminton players are there trying to play professional badminton in India? Plenty. Okay. In singles. Yeah. Probably. How many are right up at the top? There are literally two or three right up at the top. And yeah, there, there, is, a, there is a bunch that's aspiring, but just not seeming to make the cut. Okay. But now, so what's happening to all those other people? Whereas if you go to, let's say, a country like China, and now this is the other extreme, because that situation maybe isn't that healthy either, because you do hear stories coming out of the Chinese sort of sports yeah. systems yeah. where where athletes are pretty much just like, okay, well, cool, we don't need you anymore, which yeah. is obviously not what you want either. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if the top five athletes in China vanish tomorrow, it would probably be a couple of months before you knew about the next five. Yeah. yeah that wouldn't be the case in India. Yeah. Um, so it's about building that. Yes, you want the guys to get to the top. You want the, 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 you know, the peak of the sport to, to be represented, but you also want people, you know, very – very shortly behind them or Absolutely. very close behind, very close behind in a few different layers. And that doesn't happen by chance, you know. Yeah. This crazy talented people like Saina and Sindhu and whatever will come along in every couple of years. But for a country like India, I think, you know, you should be you shouldn't be you shouldn't be hoping for that. You should be yeah. you know, sort of you know. you know. That's what we were talking about uh, earlier that uh, with a population of you know over one billion you know it's a shame that you know we come up with only you know handful of medals uh, you know back from the olympics you know talking uh, you know on uh, on you know on what you said earlier you know, i was uh, world number 31 when i actually uh, took a sabbatical from the sport early this year uh, and that was largely because you know there wasn't any funds given to me so that i could go out and play tournaments um, I had to book my own tickets. I had to do my own flights. And, you know, when I was playing a match, um, the whole thought process was, damn, if I win today, tomorrow I need to change my ticket. That's going to cost me another $400. I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm not putting it as an excuse saying that, you know, I lost because of that. Yeah, but, but, that's, but that's real, though. That's yeah, real. Yeah. That's... Um, you know, you've, uh, you've, you've come up uh, and, you know, worked with, uh, you, know, you know, different countries. You know, how is the fund transparency system like in other countries? I wouldn't really be able to comment too much on the transparency from the financial side. Um, but um, I think, you know, if you're looking at an Olympic sport, the fact that individuals are trying to support themselves at that higher rank, uh, you re- uh, that just, that sounds like there's something wrong there, you know, like that doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, if, if somebody's a, I suppose golf is a, an Olympic sport now as well, but let's say somebody's a, a professional golfer, you know, that is an individual, it's an individual sport where somebody's traveling the world and it's expensive as anything to get into, it's expensive to do. Um, but that's sort of the nature of it. Um, you know, badminton is, yes, you're on the, you're on the court on your own or, or, you know, if you're a doubles pair, you're in a pair, but you travel as a team right? Like you represent your country as a team. You're not representing yourself as an individual. So I think from that point of view, you know, to hear that there isn't financial support, I don't really, again, not, not my place to comment on it. I don't know anything about the finances, but I, you'd be hard pressed to convince me that there wasn't enough money to go around to be yeah. able to look after the top players. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I've, I've, I've worked in football in, um, in South Africa. I've worked in golf around the world, um, a little bit of tennis, a bit of cricket. 
Um, and, you know, if, if a small little country like Hong Kong can afford to send um, cricketers around the world to go and play international tournaments without them having to book their own flights, without them having to do anything, they've got the support structures where all of that stuff is taken care of. I feel like, you know, a big country um, should be able to should be able to sort that stuff out, and that, that's more like the administrative side. You know, that just needs again. That's just symptoms. Uh, so, sorry, systems. Uh, that's that's yeah. not the basic stuff. You're not even trying to look for the needle in the haystack. You're not even looking for the talent yet. You're just trying to yeah, you know, yeah. get the guys to switch the computer on. Yeah. I mean, just trying to be lucky, right? You're just, we, are, we, are, we are actually very lucky to have Sindhu and Saina. You know, we are just you know hoping to be lucky again. To be really honest. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's that's not the best strategy, you know. Yeah, it's, I mean, uh, when you look at a country like Japan, um, everything seems on point. I mean, they have. Uh, if you take take women singles, for example, you have um, a couple of players in the top ten in the world. You have a, a whole crop in in that. 25 to 50 bracket and then you have another crop you know which is mainly the younger lot uh, in the 75 to 100s and there is a system in place be it funding be it tournament planning be it a battalion of you know the whole support staff the mm. the physios the entire team coaches traveling with every with at every stage there is a system in place and that's where they every year you know you see that system um, it's kind of like a vicious cycle you see players being churned out year after year. So it's not by chance that, you know, they're winning those medals. It's, it's clearly boiling down to having a, a definite system in place. No, ab- absolutely. It's, it's an equation. I mean, it's, 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 it's science, it's maths. It's, you know, it's like the stuff has been done successfully all over the world in different sports by different countries for decades now. And, um, you know, it just, look, I think, as I said, I think there probably are all the right things there, but yeah. it's not put together properly. You know, mm-hmm. you, again, I mean, I certainly don't want to be the person pointing fingers at individuals or, or administrations or whatever, but like, I just feel like if you maybe had like the right person guiding it from the top, um, yeah. and, and these things require, you know, national, you know, governmental support you you can't really do these things without that so if you have the right people at the top guiding it and and taking a a a really sort of keen interest in it and putting the right people in place lower down and then the whole sort of you know um organization structure is filled with people who who all have the same mission everyone has the same long-term goal you know and it's not it's not gold medals you know it needs to be that's like a like what i refer to as like a what goal you need a why goal. Like, why? Why do you want to do it? So, like, do you want to do it for gold medals? That's a rubbish reason. Like, that's not a good enough reason. Yeah. You want to do it because if you get this vast, ridiculous pool of resource talent that exists in India, obviously, we all know that it must and it does. If you get it to the forefront, that gives national pride. That gives, you know, kids something to aspire to. That's, that drives a much bigger thing than gold medal in 2020 or gold medal in 2024 or whatever. And that's like, yes, that, that will be a part of it. That will come. But if the bigger picture is, um, is sort of like, you know, the, the upliftment thing, the, the greater goal almost, you know, the societal upliftment, then I think that's where these things come from. Because I don't think that, you know, these countries that are very successful, I don't think, let's say, going back to New Zealand, every time they – put on the all black rugby jersey, I don't think that they're sitting there going, oh, lovely, you know, we want to we wanna win today so we can, you know, earn more money. I don't think that's it at all. You know, the, 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 like NBA, NBA classes have done studies on the all blacks for ages and it's like all about their culture. The whole culture is about like pride and national pride and, and like being a good example and, you know, like they're, they're playing for something else. They're not playing to you know, win medals and, and, and their success rates is like off the charts, you know? So I think that that's almost what you need to look at is, is that, that you, you know, we keep going back to the same word system, that that system needs to be in place for the right reason. The right people need to be involved at every level. And then it's sort of, like you said, it just, it becomes cyclical and it just keeps going. You know, once you get it going, then those wheels just carry on turning and everybody loves the results. 
it's not just the guy at the top who's making money or whatever. It's everyone, the community. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I wish I had a, you know, a, a button for, for you to push and it would just, you know, magically click into place. But I don't think I do or anyone else does. It's, I don't know. Yeah. So on that note, I think from a policy perspective, given that India, um, you know, probably stands on the brink of a sporting revolution today, given the fact, everything, I mean, the whole system, uh, I think we, we, we do um, stand on the brink of a sporting revolution of sorts, but uh, we definitely do need a, an India specific management system, uh, keeping in mind, you know, the size of our population, the stage of our um, economic development, the political, social structure, the, the cultural factors. I think everything, bearing everything in mind, we the need of the hour is a robust India-specific sport management system. Sure. So, yeah, um, yeah, yeah I think absolutely. on that on that note, I think we'll take our first break. Um, you're listening to the Millennial Athlete with Tanvi and Shlok. Um, we'll be right back. We have uh, a bunch of questions uh, left for Chris. Uh, more on the on the physical as as a physio, um, some of the things that he has to deal with uh, in terms of injuries. And we we'll be right back. We have a lot to chat chat about. Have you ever wondered how successful people do their thing? How do they navigate the challenges they often face? Are you wondering about the future of restaurants, film, education, technology, and everything else in between? Hi, I'm Gauri Devidyal, best known for being one of the brains behind the table, an award-winning restaurant in Bombay. One thing my life as a restauranter has given me is the opportunity to meet with some truly inspiring people, most often just by chatting with strangers at the community table. And that's what this podcast is about. It's about learning the new dimensions of business and understanding how different people swim this sea. It's an opportunity for me to pick their brains and ask them all the questions on my mind, whether it's about learning from their past experiences or talking about future trends. Through their journeys, stories and insights, I hope you too, like me, will come away inspired and energized. So come, join me every Wednesday with your favorite drink because this round is on me. Welcome back. Uh, you guys are listening to Millennial Athlete with Tanvi and Shlok. Uh, we still have Chris Pedra in conversation with us. Uh, Chris, uh, you know, there is, uh, uh, you know, there's sort of this rat race of, uh, you know, going to the top. And, you know, you do see sometimes athletes overtraining a bit. Uh, and and I've, I've seen it from close quarters being at the National Center for like oh, close to nine hours. Uh, you know, how do you, you know, you know, make sure that, you know, an athlete training under you is not getting burned out. You know, how, you know, how do you differentiate that? And when do you actually tell the athlete saying that, you know, okay, you, you need to stop. You need to take a couple of days of break. Um, well, so it all comes from planning. Um, you know, that's sort of the first, I suppose, the first thing you need to do. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we start with a goal um, and we say, right, where do we want to get to? How do we get there? And you sort of plot it back. So if it's, to use strength and conditioning terms, like, you know, you look at a macro cycle and in a macro cycle, maybe that's a year's worth of training. Um, and in that uh, training period, there may be two or three tournaments that the, the athlete wants to peak at. Uh, and that, that's a, probably a separate podcast in itself, but like getting athletes <laughs> to understand that you can't focus on absolutely every tournament as being like your number one priority is yeah. also quite hard. Um, and, and, and that goes back to a lot of what you said as well, Schlock, you know, the, the athletes is there paying their way and they're stressed out about finances and stuff. And I'm trying to tell him, listen, don't worry about it. Just, you know, take this as a training. He's going to make it you crazy, but, you know, <laughs> so, um, it's, it's, it's very tricky to balance the, the athlete's desire with um, what we know from science and the evidence on overtraining, uh, injury prevention and that kind of thing. But really it starts with the planning. Um, so we, we want to we want to pick out specific periods um, of the year where the athlete maybe wants to peak, um, and then you know you'd, you'd work up to that peak. Uh, and and it's not you know uh, you can see me on the camera. It's not doing this. Uh, you know you're not going at like a sixty degree incline, just ramping it up as hard as you can to get there. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a way to do it. Your body um, adapts incredibly well to stimulus. Uh, that's effectively what training is. 
But if you don't give it time to react, to adapt, you can't, you can't adapt. So your training equals a stimulus plus recovery or a stimulus plus rest. Without yeah. the rest, you need that whole equation. You can't just forget about the rest because you've decided, no, bugger that. You know, I've heard Cristiano Ronaldo trains for eight hours a day and he does a billion sit-ups, so that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's unfortunately, it's very common, uh, particularly in junior athletes who just, they feel like they have to do much more than everyone else to get ahead. Um, yeah. And maybe that's, again, where, you know, the, the, maybe the best, best athletes aren't getting through because they're actually yeah. just getting burned out, you know, whether yeah. it's their yeah. coaches or their parents or whatever. And they're just, you know, flogging themselves in their teen years. By the time they get to what should be their peak, they're just done. They're over it. You know, they've either had too many yeah. injuries or they're sick of it or, or whatever. But so going back to the plan, you, you've got your periodized idea. And then all of that, if you can imagine sort of zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, and then eventually you get to your, let's say, a week or 10 days, you know, micro cycle. So seven or 10 days micro cycle. And in that, you would also plan, you plan hard days, easy days, hard days, easy days, hard days, easy days. Now, all those plans are wonderful, but obviously the athlete needs to listen. Yeah. He <laughs> needs to be open. I mean, I mean, more than the athlete, I think also the coaches need to be open to that. Yeah. I mean, we've got old school coaches here who like, yeah. you know, you are going to run 25 rounds of 400 meters. You're going to run till you actually die. One, sir. 100%. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, that, is, that is the challenge. And, and, and going back to what I said about having the right people in the right places, you know, unfortunately what we find and what I've found a lot of the time is you end up getting coaches who were very good players themselves and they're just like the natural progression in a system that isn't mature is that the best player, well, you know, they must be the best coach. But if you do look at mature systems, like let's take football, for example, everybody knows about football, biggest game in the world. Very rarely are the best players going on to become the best coaches. Yeah, they... you know, the, the best coaches in the world were guys who played second or third division, or maybe they played at the top level, but for a very short period of time or something like that, you know? Um, so it is de- definitely the athlete and the coach trying to get them to buy in. And that's really one of the fundamentals of what we try and do from a, from a, a performance enhancement or a, a sort of um, injury prevention, whatever point of view is trying to get athlete and coach buy in. And both are as, as, as important as the other, because as you said, the coaches in, at the end of the day is driving the session. And if you're sitting there every day saying, no, listen, you know, I'm not doing any more because of X, Y, Z, and the coach takes offense, then obviously that could affect your, you know, that could affect your, your, your place in the system. So um, it's, it's really, really important. And it's a very hard juggle, to be honest. But I think education is probably just the, the, the short answer there is you really do need to educate the athletes, educate the coach, yeah. um, and, and, and put it in front of them, put the data in front of them, you know, get them to be on board. It's not about me telling you what to do and you blindly listening. Yeah. That's ridiculous. The best athletes in the world want to know. They want to understand. They want to say, well, why? Why, why are we doing a light session yeah, today? I yeah, feel great, yeah, yeah. you know, or whatever. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, education is important. Sorry to, to cut you in there, but um, mm-hmm. I mean, I remember having this conversation with you for the first time, uh, you know, the term progressive overload that you uh, explained to me. I think I, I heard this term for the first time at 23 I mean, this was a conversation that probably I should have had with the person guiding me at, you know, the very start of my career. Absolutely. I mean, um, as a culture, you know, when we look at the Asians and the Asian style of training vis-a-vis the European style of training, everything is, you know, everything, like you said, their rest days, their, um, the days when they need to push hard in the gym, when they need to take things easy, everything's planned. They're given breaks through the year. Whereas in India, it's this whole thing of, you know, time is running out. If you don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. These are the insecurities that hound an athlete, you know, even at 15, 16, 17, they're seeing um, people around them work. And, you know, it's, it's, it's this kind of 24 hour pressure cooker kind of environment that they're in all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so I think athlete burnout is, is a very Asian thing. Uh, you would see it more in countries like India, China. Um, and you see, you, you do see a couple of players, yes, peaking very early on, like for instance, Ratchanok and Tanon became world champion at 16. And then, you know, they, they kind of fade out as, you know, pretty early as well. 
Yeah. Look, I suppose, you know, for, for the individuals, you probably have to know their injury or you'd have to know their history to be able to sort of make specific statements about them. But it is, you know, I'm glad you brought it up. It is quite an, you know, Asian, um, I suppose, characteristic. Uh, and I don't know if that just comes from, you know, years and years of, of, of the culture or, or whatever, but the sort of 10,000 hours, I think when, when that, when that yeah. concept made it to Asia, you know, uh, from Malcolm Gladwell or, or whoever the, the original guy was, I can't remember his name, but Malcolm Gladwell certainly popularized it. Um, and when that came across here, I mean, that must have been music to so many parents' ears, you know, because that's like, that fits the Asian culture down to a T, you know, you work harder, you work longer, you do much more than everyone else and you will be successful. And in the, in the bulk of situations, you will be successful. You know, if you put in so much effort, but the, nobody talks about the downside, you know, for that one person who does rise to the top and, and manages to be the, you know, the 16 year old world champion, how many other kids were trying to do the exact same thing and nobody's ever heard of them? Absolutely. You know, how many other kids made all those sacrifices and nobody's ever heard of them? So the, the problem with that 10,000 hour rule and that concept is we're looking at the exceptions and we're making them the rule. You know, Tiger Woods is the exception. But because Tiger Woods made it, everyone's like, oh, well, you've got to start swinging a golf club at the age of two. Yeah. No. It's, he's a freak. There's a lot more going on there. He's, he's, yeah. he's the greatest golfer ever. He's unbelievably talented. There's so many factors at play there. But the one thing you're looking at is the fact that he started swinging a golf club when he was two. Yeah. You know, like it's, yeah. it's just a convenient way to do things. And it's lazy. It's super lazy. Yeah. I mean, um, Taking this thought forward, um, you know, UK sport um, has implemented uh, the TAS uh, scheme, which is the Talented Athlete Scholarship Scheme, which is basically funded. uh, It's a funded partnership between talented athletes, uh, the sporting universities and the national governing body of sport, which is UK sport. And, um, you know, TAS basically helps athletes to have this holistic uh, approach to um, their whole sporting journey. So they, they do have a fair bit of education. They don't, you know, say goodbye to their books uh, when they decide to uh, pursue sport. And they also end up, you know, if, if, if yes, if they, if they really see their sporting career taking off, then yes, you, you can go ahead and make a decision. But they're at least given that support in the, in the development stage. Um, what's your take on the concept of a dual career given the you know, there is, there is a lot of risk, a, a risk associated with uh, the short lifespan of an athlete. So what's your take on um, the dual career approach to Indian sport? Uh, what do you mean the dual career approach to Indian sport? I mean, uh, is there a possibility of integrating education and um, sport in a country like India? I think you have to. I mean, that's got to be the, that's got to be the, like I said, the why. You know, the, the whole thing. Sport needs to be a vehicle, not just to get people money and quick riches and a couple of gold medals. It's got to have more of a purpose than that, surely, you know. And, and this is where countries like Australia, the States, the US, whatever, they, they appreciate that. And they, they turn, and it doesn't mean that it doesn't have to be this big business machine that generates cash. Of course it does. Just look at every American sport there is. But how are those American sports run how they managed there's massive talent identification from a young age those kids go into like very 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 organized structures whether you agree with the exact running of the structures across sports is is up for debate but from from it from being an identified or from being identified as a talented kid those guys are pretty much institutionalized all the way through and there's no ways that they can't, that, that those guys are going to go through or, or the bulk of them are going to go through without getting an education. It's just not going to happen. You know, same thing in Oz, same thing in South Africa. You know, look, there's a lot of gray areas as well. The guys will masquerade bursaries and, you know, like a whole lot of stuff, you know, those kind of things to get them playing for their teams and come to my university. And then, you know, there's a little bit of, oh, well, don't worry about it. We're not really worried about that because you're an athlete. So they, they are obviously you know, um, occasions and instances and examples of it not really working. But on the whole, I would say what you're referring to, that TAS scheme, I mean, it sounds, it sounds absolutely perfect. It sounds what you need, right? Because if you look at this, the stats, you know, a thousand kids going to 
Gopi's Academy in the summer holidays to go and have trials, how many of those kids are going to have a future, a, a guaranteed future in badminton where they yeah. can support themselves? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so one person, yeah, one what's person happening to the other guys? Yeah. Like, so, so, you know, it's, it's I, 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 can't, I can't see how you can't agree with the TAS system, to be honest, to answer yes. you that way. Like, I, I think it just, it just makes logical sense. Like, that's how it should be. You're looking after resources. You know, yeah. you're not just churning through numbers because you're, you're, because you're, you're backing the volume system. Oh, well, yeah. you know, we've got a billion people, so let's, yeah. Just, yeah. let's just flog yeah. them all as hard as we can. And, you know, whoever's left standing, they'll be good. Like, that's a crazy system. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you look even from a post-athletic career perspective, uh, you know, a country like in, you would have athletes in a country like India dealing with identity issues because beyond sport or, you know, you've, you've finished your sporting career and then, then what, you know, do you have an education to fall back on? Do you have any, any other side of your personality that's been developed to, you know, kind of see you through the remaining part of your life? Sure, sure. And, and so going back to the, you know, filling people at every level with the right people. While I don't think that the best players are necessarily the best coaches, wouldn't a person who's grown up through the system and been involved in the international game be a very, a very good sort of fit for an administrator if they had the necessary academic sort of, you know, qualifications for that role? Or, or, or you know, there are loads of different factors. So let's say a badminton player doesn't quite make it but they've also gone to university and done a BCom or maybe they've done an MBA or whatever, then they can do an MBA afterwards. And that person then goes in to work for badminton administration. I feel like that's a much better fit than a guy who's was possibly a really, really good player. He's got loads of connections through the whole sort of system, of course. And, you know, he finishes his career and he sort of needs a job and it's like, okay, well, you know, we've got a place here for you. Why don't you come and do this? And then the guy's all of a sudden deciding policy, you know, strategies for, youth sport or youth badminton in India, like that sounds like a little bit of a crazy fit, you know, you, you yeah. maybe want somebody a little bit more qualified than that. I, I, I uh, disclaimer, I don't have anyone in mind. I'm not specifically <laughs> saying anyone or anything. I'm just saying, you know, that, that it can only be a good thing having educated athletes come out of the system because then they can give back to the system. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, that, I mean, that is exactly going to be my blueprint now. Uh, not that I've not been working on it, but uh, thank you, Chris, for giving me a little more clarity. <laughs> I think about this also for uh, a long time now. I mean, uh, on, a, on, a, on a lighter note, how long have you been in Mumbai now? Uh, we are coming up to five years, man. Five years, <laughs> eh? Can you speak a little bit of Hindi? Yeah, oh, man, I have absolutely none. I can, like, I can understand that people are abusing me and speaking about me, but I, can't, I don't know enough to speak back. Um, but that said, my son, my son is starting to pick up a little bit. He's, um, he's nearly three years old. He's a Mumbaika proper. He was born in Mumbai, um, and he's picked up a handful of words in that. So, yeah, he's representing the family. Have you gotten used to the, uh, the Indian nodding system? Of, I mean, of, of, when you say of, system, what do you of, mean? Of, of Indian, of Indian uh, people <laughs> just nodding their heads right yeah. and left. No, I think I think that's another system that could use a lot of help. Is the <laughs> is the is the the nods because there are no two nods that are the same. The same <laughs> nod means four different things on different days. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I've started nodding. My mate is <laughs> I'm back now. Like I say, you know, they're talking and like instead of like answering, I just be like. <laughs> you know, give them a nod, and they're like, oh, "Did you just nod at me?" Yeah, Chris's Chris's standard uh, question. Okay, what have you done today? Is your knee hurting? And I used to nod, and he used to be like, "Is that a yes or a no?" I mean, yeah. say something. You gotta help me here. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, on that, uh, you know, light note. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, for being uh, a part of our podcast today. And sharing your perspective on uh, on the current scenario of Indian sport, it was a pleasure to have you today. Thank you so much for taking out uh, time from a busy schedule. You know, kind of, I loved every moment of you being on the show. Absolute pleasure, man. It's um, yeah, it's really cool to see you guys again. I uh, haven't seen either of you in person for a while, but it's nice to catch up. Um, and yeah, man, I think you know the you guys. Asking these questions, your, you know, your go sports, your OGQs, all of these guys trying to get involved, Reliance Foundations, the guys down in Bangalore, you know, there are a lot of people who are, who are 
really like getting involved in sports across the board. And I think the only direction can be, you know, up. Um, you, just, you just need, I think, maybe a little bit of patience. Uh, it's never going to happen overnight. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think if we can all sort of try and be part of the solution as opposed to just, you know, it's easy to bash it. It's easy to sort of point at things and go, oh, this is wrong, that's wrong, the next thing. But if we can all try and be part of the solution, man, there's, the, the possibility and the opportunity in this country is immense, man. It's so exciting. I really, really hope. I really hope in the next, hopefully I'm here for three or five years, something like that, in that time we see, you know, a significant improvement, particularly with regards to medals. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, absolutely, yes. man. Um, on that note, it's time for our final break. Uh, on the other side of the break, uh, Tanvi and I will share our perspective uh, of a possible blueprint for India to become a sporting powerhouse in the future. You guys are listening to episode two of The Millennial Athlete with Tanvi and Shlok. We'll be right back. Entertainment is like food for the brain. It's a window to culture and a great way to understand the world around us. The internet has changed what it means to be an entertainer, creating new storytellers with millions of fans. It has spawned a new breed, the story sellers, those behind the scenes creating the business for this ecosystem. They work with brands, platforms and channels who are keen to capitalize on an audience hungrier than ever for more stories. I am Vineet Kanabar and I have a ringside view to how stories are told and sold. On my show, I bring you creators, artists, executives and marketers for a freewheeling conversation around the business of entertainment. Tune in to Storytellers and Storysellers for personal stories, analysis and criticism every Thursday as I talk to the brightest minds telling or selling great stories today. Uh, welcome back guys. Uh, you're listening to The Millennial Athlete with Tanvi and Shlok. Wow, Tanvi, that was one insightful chat, wasn't it? Absolutely. I mean, um, Chris has probably answered all those deep questions that I had posed to you uh, at the start of our episode. He's put everything into perspective and I'm um, pretty clear now. I have all my answers ready. Um, There is no doubt that India is on the brink of a sporting revolution. Um, The only thing probably that's missing is a certain degree of professionalism within the existing system of sport administration. Um, probably minimizing the bureaucracy and a little bit of the red tapeism that has plagued our system for a while. Um, and just, you know, professionalizing everything about our system. The, the sporting ecosystem has various players uh, like coaches, support staff, parents, mentors, uh, governance agencies. And just, just streamlining the entire system, I think, is the way forward. I think a good way to start would be, uh, you know, having high performance uh, centers in every state uh, so that the top players from each state uh, could actually go and train uh, with the best players. Uh, And, you know, with the education, as you know, you mentioned how important education is and a side by side education policy also going on. And, you know, obviously, you know, then they could, uh, you know, you know, the top players, you know, playing well at the domestic level, but then graduate uh, to the high performance center. I think that could be. Uh, a, a good start, you know, considering where we are, uh, and that should actually kick off the vicious, uh, vicious cycle of sport which you talked about. Absolutely, I mean, building champions takes uh, a hell lot of inspiration, patience, and starts with building a sporting culture in the country. Uh, we did witness the uh, the Kelo India. Uh, program that was introduced by the government, um, the sports ministry a couple of uh, months back, uh, which which was introduced to revive the sporting culture in India at the grassroots level by building a strong framework for all sports played in our country. And uh, I mean, yes, India is bound to become a sporting nation, like, like Chris said, uh, it's just a matter of being patient. And uh, when you've got something to prove, I think a challenge is a good starting point. So uh, on that note, uh, fingers crossed and um, looking forward to uh, a good couple of years ahead. Uchu vichar, Tanvi, uchu vichar. You know, on that note, I want to wait, you know, say like a very dialogue, uh, you know, which has been running on our end. So it goes, Khelega India, tabhi to jeetega India. Uh, so yeah, on that note, we come to an end uh, for this episode of the Millennial Athlete with Tanvi and Shlok. Uh, if you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. 
you can listen to all of them on the ivm podcast app or ivmpodcast.com you can also follow ivm on their social media that is ivm podcast on twitter and instagram if you want us uh, to to talk about anything specific uh, please uh, reach out to us on our social media handles uh, you can find me shlok ramchandran on twitter and instagram with the id s h l o k h 95 uh and tanvi what about yours yeah mine is uh, t a n v i l a d 93 on instagram and twitter until then ciao uh, we shall be back uh, very soon with another episode of the millennial athlete with tanvi and slow stay safe guys thank you namaskar this is ashish vidyarthi Yes my friend these are challenging times but in these challenging times we can create something extraordinary do take time to listen to my podcast begin the journey available on the IVM podcast website app or wherever you listen to podcasts remember we have a great opportunity for life cheers peshe khidmat hai aapki shaan mein hamare anjuman se Hi, I am Sadaf and I'm Arshad. Khane ka itihas, economics, policy, psychology, sab hai menu pe. Only on the Nankali podcast every Wednesday sirf IVM podcast app ya website par ya fir jahan se bhi aap apne podcast sunte ho.